This is Josh Ho of the Decarceration Nation podcast, and today I want to tell you the story of William Garrison. William Garrison was sentenced for a life without parole sentence at the age of 16 for first-degree murder. A Supreme Court case allowed his sentence to be revisited when they determined that juvenile life without parole sentences were potentially unconstitutional. Over the opposition of the prosecutor, the judge resentenced Mr. Garrison to a term of 40 to 90 years, and since he had, at that point, already served 43 years and had been a model prisoner, the parole board granted his release. But he chose instead to be discharged based on cashing in his over 7,000 days of good time, which he had built up over all of his years incarcerated. He was due to be released in September. And then COVID-19 happened, and he decided instead of waiting till September that he wanted to try to get out. So he returned to the parole board and the parole board granted his request for parole again. He was waiting to see what would happen as a result of that, because in Michigan, the prosecutor has the chance to oppose a new parole. He was waiting to see if Wayne County prosecutor Kim Worthy was going to protest his parole. Her window to oppose the parole would have ended on May 6th. In other words, in just a few weeks, it was very likely that William Garrison was about to get out of prison. But unfortunately, on April 13th, after 45, four years incarcerated, William Garrison passed away from COVID-19. He was able to survive 44 years of incarceration, but he was not released in time to enjoy his parole. Over a month ago, I and many other advocates across Michigan started to press elected officials and the governor to release people who were close to their release dates. And yet as of today, 21 incarcerated people and two staff people have died, while 574 incarcerated people and 210 staff people have been diagnosed as COVID positive in Michigan's prisons. We have no idea what has been happening in Michigan's 81 county jails. We're going to find out later that almost all of these deaths, like Mr. Garrison's death, could easily have been prevented if people had simply listened to us, had some political courage, and exercised some compassion. Some will say, but he committed a violent crime. Yes, that's true. People are not defined solely by their worst moments. I have seen several people who are sentenced for murder engage in work that has saved lives once they were finally released, and also seen people save lives in prison who were sentenced for murder. When we throw people away and ignore the, their potential for change, we waste two lives instead of one. We ignore the good that these people can do later in life. We ignore the family that cares about them. We ignore their children, and we choose to close our hearts to all notions of forgiveness, which is central to my faith tradition. And let's not mince words. This is retribution, pure retribution. This is not self-preservation. The risk of a long-serving incarcerated person over the age of 55 committing another violent crime is nearly zero. As Professor Sonia Starr and J.J. Prescott recently explained in the new research paper called Understanding Violent Crime Recidivism, Individuals convicted of violent crimes constitute a majority of the imprisoned population and are often ignored by existing proposals aimed at reducing incarceration's broad scope. Policies that seem to seek to shrink the expanse of prison population while ignoring prisoners who have committed violent offenses will fail to address the core of the problem and will likely exacerbate existing inequalities in the criminal justice system. And at this moment, the stakes are amplified by the risk of the spread of COVID-19 behind bars. Older prisoners are especially at risk, but most of them have violent crime convictions, which could stand in the way of measures taken to protect them. It has never been more important to understand whether this instinctive fear of violent recidivism that has long pervaded criminal justice policy is really grounded in fact. It bears emphasis that in every study, the vast majority, usually more than 99% of those convicted of homicide do not commit another homicide upon release. The low rate underscores that there are at least as great of many people incarcerated for homicide that in fact pose little or no risk if and when they are released. 
Professor Starr and Prescott go on to argue that as age goes up, as people get older, they become less and less likely to commit new crimes and especially new violent crimes, which means that while some people do indeed recidivate for violent crimes, older people in prison rarely, like very incredibly, like a percentage of a percentage risk that they ever commit another violent crime. From now on, when people like the tabloid press highlight the one person who commits a new crime instead of the thousands of others who were released and did not recidivate, I will think back to the lack of moral courage, which resulted in the very preventable death of William Garrison, who should have been released as soon as COVID broke. People assume that we were arguing that jails and prisons should just open the doors and let everybody out. You see it in the press. Advocates say people should just be let out of prison. In a sense, that's true. But what we're arguing is a lot more serious and nuanced than that. We are arguing that everyone who can be let out easily should be let out as soon as possible. This includes all the nonviolent and low-level folks everyone loves to talk about and all the governors are trying to move to. Well, at least some of the governors are trying to move to. We also believe that everyone due to be released soon for any crime should be released. There is no actual logic or science behind sentence lengths. They're literally made up. There's no reason someone should be kept in prison for an extra month during a pandemic at risk of death. Sure, a line has to be drawn somewhere, but at least draw that line and save some people. We also believe that everyone else should not be excluded but rather that they should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. When someone has served 44 years, they are in an at-risk category and they were not sentenced to die by incarceration or by COVID-19. They should be released. You should especially take into account all of the evidence that suggests when people pose little risk to public safety. Many folks who committed violent crimes but had been incarcerated for long periods of time pose almost no risk, no public safety risk, and should be considered for immediate re release. We also believe that parole boards should be expanded, emergency powers should be used to allow for expanded release, and that support for reentry and housing should be expanded. Sure, we would like to see large numbers of people released, but we want to make sure that the public safety risk from COVID-19 is not larger than the risks from recidivism, which is what we're seeing now. There are a lot of people in our prisons who've been in our prisons for a very long time. Those people do not pose a risk to society. We incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people often feel like we'll never be forgiven until we die. What we should never accept and what we will never accept is the idea that we should accept political games when, li games when lives are on the line. People in prison are fathers and mothers. They are sons and daughters. People love and care about them. And none of them were, were, were sentenced to die from COVID-19. It's time to act. It's time to remember William Garrison. And it's time to let my people go. I hope you hear this. I hope the governor hears this. I hope you all help keep spreading the word. Let my people go.